Thanks. Our reading uh, this morning comes from the Gospel of John, uh, from chapter 15, and it's titled The Vine and the Branches. I don't know if anybody uh, wants a moment to follow it. I'm reading from the NIV, starting from verse 1. I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he is like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be given to you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. I've told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant, servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I've called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I've made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. This is my command. Love each other. Thanks be to God. And now I'm going to hand over to Carl, our uh, moderator, who's going to uh, bring us a message. Thank you. Morning all. It is to be with you this morning and uh, can I just say thank you to um, all those that have put quite a lot of effort into organising online gatherings over what seems like a very long period of time. Your, your work and your service for your brothers and sisters in the church is very much appreciated. Uh, it will, co will continue to, to be so um, uh, as uh, there's a blended approach to our worship in these coming weeks. We're all desperate for the day when actually restrictions are gone and it's a possibility to gather together um, uh, all together in the same place. Although whether we'll all rush back straight away remains to be seen, but at least to have the option will be a lovely thing. But in these days, we thank you, those that have been serving us by making this a possibility. You are very, very wonderful people. Um, uh, my greetings also from the association team, from uh, Nigel and from Phil and from Kathy, uh, and also my greetings from Chris, um, uh, who uh, you know very well. Uh, she would love for as many of you as possible to join us virtually uh, for her ordination and her induction service in a couple of Saturday's time. It's so wonderful, isn't it, to see God's purposes and plans worked out in the lives of those who we care for, and it's so wonderful to see that in Chris's life as well. We're going to get into this passage and into this uh, new series of teaching but before we do let, let's just pray for one second. Our Heavenly Father we thank you for these days. Lord they're tough and God you know our hearts, you know that we find these days difficult but Lord I thank you that in all times 
and in all circumstances you are the God who speaks you are the God who loves us you are the God who desires for us to grow more like you Jesus and so we pray God that over these uh, next few moments you by your spirit speak to us through your word Lord we desire to reflect you better to a world that is so in need of hope so in need of the goodness of you the goodness of your spirit at work and so lord please work through us your people hear our prayer this day amen so we begin a new series of teaching today which your new minister nick has put together for us and you'll hear a number of voices over these coming weeks 10 weeks at least i think bring us to the end of june um so through the summer term thinking about the fruit of the spirit a, a subject that some of you will have thought on and will have looked at before and some may be for the very first time my prayer is is that god brings something new and something fresh to us maybe bring things back to mind that he has spoke to us before so that we as Muttley Baptist Church are reflecting these fruit of the spirit more in our lives and that the world around us is changed thanks Andy for reading that passage from John 15 uh, it seems like a, 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 an interesting place to start rather than just diving straight into the passage from Galatians believe me you will get there um, and please do have a little read of the passage from Galatians chapter 5 maybe this afternoon so that you can see the direction of travel but when we're thinking of fruit and bearing fruit this most definitely is um, a go-to passage possibly the go-to passage I wonder how lockdown has been for you. Have, have you been one of these people that over this last year have uh, de decided to develop yourself, maybe uh, with uh, the changes to your normal routines over lockdown? If, if you work and you've been furloughed um, it, it, with a change to being not able to get out as much, you've decided to do something new to improve yourself. Uh, there's been a huge uptake in those that have decided to learn a new language over the last year i wonder whether that is you have you decided to to try and pick up a new language maybe uh, for your holidays for your own interest uh, there's been quite a few people that have, have, have bought thousands of books um, from a whole genre of material that's out there at the moment. Uh, if, if you've been able to go into Waterstones uh, in Drake Circus, you'd find bookshelves of self-improvement guides one way or another. Um, uh, the Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, uh, 12 Rules for Life, The Psychology of Optimal Experience, just just a few that, that are of literally thousands of self-improvement books that are available or blogs these days that you might have got into, podcasts that you have subscribed to over this period of time. I've been fascinated but personally by the amount of us that have decided that we might try and use the last year to get fit. Some, some of you might have joined me in all of this and uh, Joe Wicks has led the way. Uh, there have been uh, a, apparently an explosion, maybe uh, those of us that are medics among us might testify to this, uh, an explosion of Joe Wicks related injuries over this last year uh, be they uh, bad backs twisted ankles whatever they might be as we've tried to keep up with this super fit person on the screen and some of us have um, done um, as best as we can some of us have failed uh, and and some of us um, have really succeeded uh, here's a picture of me on my morning workout just on the edge of Dartmoor um, overlooking the city uh, at least I wish. Um, uh, that's how I think I look. The honest truth of it is, is that I normally look like a very red sweatball whenever I decide to go do a little bit of exercise. But I have tried to get fit, to improve myself over this period of time. When we look at the fruit of the spirit, the temptation is to start thinking in those terms that this is almost a self-improvement plan for those of us who are followers of Jesus. Uh, and that each of these, and we will look at them in turn over these coming weeks, are things that we need to grab hold of and we need to put into play into our lives. That's great news. Each of these is a life changing i believe a world changing characteristic that if we displayed them in our lives more then we would be changed and the world around us those who we interact with would be changed if every christian in the world were to truly display each of these fruit in their life then i believe the world 
would be changed. Well, that's great news. The bad news is you can't do it. Stay with me, please don't give up, don't tune out. But here's the thing, you can't do it. As hard as you try, you can't, like some self-improvement guide, put these things into play in your life. You can try your best and you might feel like some days you're succeeding on one or two of these nine. But to get love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control all maxed out in your life, that is something that I think in your own strength you will fail to do. Well, wow. There's another bit of good news, and that is that you can bear these fruit in your life. You can't do it yourself, but the passage that Andy just read to us outlines ideally the way that we bear all of these fruit in our lives. This wonderful passage from John chapter 15 and verse 1 to 17 each verse in itself could be a sermon well <laughs> believe me we're not going to go there today um, i'm not going to keep you for a massive length of time this morning i'm going to pull some thoughts from this passage but alongside reading that passage from galatians 5 the fruit of the spirit please do read back this passage later on and allow the spirit of god to speak to you through the passage maybe in ways that i won't have mentioned this morning but i believe this to be such a centrally important passage for us as, as andy mentioned at the, the top of the service this whole imagery of vines and vineyards is certainly familiar in scripture through the old testament the nation of israel was referred to as the vine and coming into play here is the the, the commission the the abrahamic commission of the, where god commissions abraham to be a blessing to all nations god says to to abraham in in genesis 12 i will bless you and you will be a blessing to all nations on earth and father abraham the father of this new nation was god's channel of blessing that the fruit that was born through this nation least the fruit that should have been born through this nation would be a blessing to the whole of the world You'll read through the Old Testament references to the nation of Israel bearing fruit one way or another. Uh, one Andy Pope pointed out at the beginning of the service, but the, the Old Testament prophets often bring this metaphor into play when they're challenging God's people if they've not done what they ought to have. There's a, a passage from Isaiah chapter 5, a song of Isaiah from Isaiah chapter 5 that, that says this. I will sing for the one I love, a song about his vineyard. My loved one has a vi vineyard on a fertile hillside. He dug it up and cleared it of stones and planted it with the choicest vines. He built a tower on it and cut out a wine press as well. He looked for a crop of good grapes, but it yielded only bad fruit. Oh dear. The, the, there's such hope in those early words. My guess is that whatever tune this went along to was was it's almost certainly a folk song. This isn't it, or maybe even the blues, um, because there's this sense of hope deferred, this sense of possibility that's not being achieved in this passage. God had prepared this nation to bear good fruit, to be a blessing to the world around it. Yet, in the words of Isaiah, it yielded only bad fruit. When we get to the beginning of this passage in John's Gospel, we read these words. Jesus says to these people gathered in at this point in time around a, a Passover table or just after the Passover has happened. Jesus' closest disciples and friends, those from this Jewish heritage, I am the true vine. One of, and in this gospel, the last of the I am phrases of Jesus. I am the true vine, says Jesus. Let's just stop there for a second and realise just how massive this is. Because those gathered with Jesus that day would have heard this imagery of a vine being referred to as a nation, not as a person. And now suddenly Jesus says that it's not the nation that's the vine. I am the true vine. 
suddenly there is something that is life changing happening. God's plan to bless the nations of the world suddenly becomes slightly different than they'd ever realised before. Well, those closest to Jesus might have had this beginning to, to come to mind as they'd spent three years with Jesus, hearing his teaching and watching him in action, that there was a different plan that God was revealing now that Jesus was here. They wouldn't have seen at this point the full extent of that plan of God, but they would have sensed that this person, the one they were beginning to recognise as the Messiah, was bringing a different way, a different plan into the world. Now, people will argue to what extent this rules in or rules out the nation of Israel in bearing fruit. I'm not going to go there today. You can have that discussion at another time if you would wish to. But what this does is it opens up the possibility that you and I, those of us not from a Jewish background, can be bearers of fruit that will bless the nations of the world today. This is why this passage, I believe, is so centrally important to you and to I in our lives and to the world in which each of us lives in the here and now. No longer is this just for one nation, that this now is for you and for I. So, how does this new way of bearing God's good fruit to the world work? Well, wh what's the plan? Jesus says these words, remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Jesus brings to mind here just where we started that you can try and be, be ones that are, are exhibiting love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. You can try as much as you like, but if you do it on your own, you can't do it. Apart from me, says Jesus, you can do nothing. Here we've got the crux of this passage, that the way that we are going to be bearers of this good fruit is to root ourselves in the vine, to be branches of the vine, to be those whose source is Jesus. Where do you find your life-giving source? People look in all kinds of different places, and that's including those who would say that they're followers of Jesus, who are brothers and sisters in the church, me and you. If we're honest, sometimes the life-giving source can be in other places rather than in Jesus. It can be sometimes in our work, our jobs, nothing at all wrong with that. But is that what fires us? Is that the source of our life? Is, is that where our, our roots are found? Uh, is it in within our families? To be honest, for myself, I love my family so dearly with all of my heart. I can see just how that can be the case. Nothing wrong with that. But if that is the sole source of what is life giving for me, am I going to be a bearer of this good fruit to the world around us? It's tempting to see that the, the negative things, you know, people try and find a source within alcohol or within drugs or or, or within a string of relationships, uh, not none of which um, have got much substance. We, we can think in those negative terms. But the reason I've come up with two positive things is because I believe that this speaks to you and I, sisters and brothers, followers of that almighty Lord God that we were reminded of in our opening reading this morning. This is for us. Where do we find our source of life? How has Jesus loved his disciples? He says in verse 9, as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. The question's got to be asked, how therefore has Jesus loved these disciples? 
at, at this point in time, they won't have seen the life giving sacrifice that Jesus has made. This is before his arrest, before he is led and judged and crucified, before his resurrection and him appearing again to his disciples and his, his ascension to heaven. So, so how have these disciples seen Jesus love them? I want to wind you back a couple of chapters to chapter 13 of John's gospel for the answer to that one, at least part of it. I mean, the full answer is that Jesus' love will have been displayed to them in many, many different ways. But in chapter 13, what we see is the rabbi, the leader, the one who they'd come to recognise many of them as their Messiah, on his knees, washing their filthy feet. The job of the lowliest servant in the household is the job that Jesus assumed right there in that room with water and with cloth in hand. He took the water and washed the filthy feet of his disciples, serving them with humility that would not have been known of a rabbi, let alone of someone considered to be the Messiah, surely. So some of the disciples balked at this and, and tried to push Jesus away. No, Father, you will not wash my feet. Jesus insists and says that, yes, he will. That servant-hearted, humble service of others is a demonstrative act of love that would still be ringing in the ears that, that would have been present in the minds of those disciples as Jesus said these words to them in John 15 9 as the father has loved me so I have loved you this sense of loving service is the theme the heart behind what Jesus is saying here but how are they to remain in Jesus' love? If that is the command, then, then how are they to do it? Jesus says this, if you keep my commands, you will remain in my love. What's the command? My command is this, said Jesus, love each other as I have loved you. I'm not going to steal the thunder too much from next week's sermon because you'll be looking at this subject of love next week. But suffice it to say that if we're looking for the life giving source that flows through Jesus from the father through the vine to us, the branches, what is that life giving source? What is the thing that will manifest itself in good fruit that will be a blessing to the nations sisters and brothers it's love it's love and this is a command that jesus gives in other gospels a new command that jesus gives to his disciples to love one another as jesus has loved them have we done that it's okay in many ways thinking about others and saying well <laughs> To be honest, they didn't do that. I prefer for us to look at ourselves before our Heavenly Father, before Jesus, who has loved us in that centrally a sacrificial, foot washing, life giving way. And then to say, Have I loved others in that way? Have I truly? That's a challenge to me today, and it's one that needn't be condemning. Please do not hear that in my voice. Instead, hear an encouragement. Because if I look at myself and I recognise that I've not loved others as Jesus has loved me, that's not necessarily the permanent way it needs to stay. My prayer is, is that this series of teaching will be a series where you, I, where we grow closer to Jesus because we recognise the love flowing through Jesus the vine to us, the branches, and we drink it in and we come again before Jesus and we say, Father, I need to love like you have loved. Will you work that into the core of who I am rather than focusing on trying to pop out some good fruit instead let's focus on being rooted in the source being rooted in Jesus you may have noticed that in the passage that Andy read to us 
as you've been looking at it in your Bible, there's one word that keeps popping out time and time again. And I want to finish by just spending a little bit of time on this word. It would be remiss of me not to, I think. Depending on your translation, then you would have read the word time and again in this passage, either remain or abide. Remain, 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 abide, abide, abide. Now, you might kind of have some feelings about the different nuances and connotations of words. And in the English language, of course, it's not as rich as it is in New Testament Greek in terms of this. But but even so, there's, there's, there's something here which is slightly different in these translations. Remain, I think, has a connotation of staying the same. We, we remain the same almost. There's something that is quite static about, about that. Well, I'm not sure that that's kind of what we're wanting here. The, 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 the vine doesn't remain the same it, it, it sprouts a branch which is dynamic and alive and growing and, and, and bears good fruit it doesn't remain the the, the same uh, but it, it it does need to have a residence to dwell in a place to 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 live in a place which is why i like the word abide to have one's abode to dwell what i believe that we need to do is increasingly learn to abide learn to linger if you like learn to dwell in the presence of god at, at, at this point in our lives as the christian church we we've got options open to us because of the recent history that we've had we've done an awful lot to react to the various changes that we've all had to go through over this last year me speaking to you in this way is just one of the many ways that you as church have had to uh, to respond and and react to, to what has happened all around of us and at this junction as we begin to embrace some semblance of normality we can quickly rush to reconstruct things we, we can do that for some of us in a way that wants it to look exactly like it looked when we finished just just before the first lockdown can, can I, I i counsel against just rushing back with rose tinted spectacles to the way things were before i've heard some in uh, amongst our church family in the southwest talk about the sunday before first lockdown like it was it was peak church like like uh, the the pinnacle of what it means to be the bride of christ was achieved the sunday before the first lockdown and so they're rushing back to that again sisters and brothers it wasn't that crash hot the Sunday before the first lockdown. Uh, it was at best not bad at all, but I don't think we'd reach the greatest beauty that the bride of Christ can reach on earth. Please don't rush back to the way things were before. Look forwards to a, a new way, to, to a dynamic movement and a growing and, and a flourishing and a blossoming into a different church than we've experienced before but we can do that and i'm one of the, that's that's my own worst critic on this one we can do that with too much urgency we can try and reconstruct things when actually just at this point in time we are battered we are bruised some of us have lost those who are closest to us some of us have had to accompany others through the most life-changing period of time that we have ever known if we rush too quickly I think, to reconstruct a different way of being for ourselves and for the church at this point, we will we'll end up missing out on something that's so important. What we need to do is to dwell. We need to reside. We need to linger, to drink in that source from the vine, the presence of God, and we need to recover. Let's spend these weeks Let's spend these next weeks recovering. But to do that, we place ourselves intentionally in that vine. We place ourselves daily in Christ in a way that helps us to draw life that we so desperately need before we start reconstructing again. Let's learn to linger. Let's learn to live in Christ so that we might bear good fruit. We're coming to an end now and like I say next week you'll be considering this whole aspect of love 
please, as you go through each of these fruit, don't see them as some self-improvement thing. You really can't do this on your own. A way to, 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 to bear good fruit is simply to come back to Jesus, to be branches that are firmly rooted in him as our source, useful branches, not ones which are cast aside, but ones that are useful branches that bear good fruit. If that requires a little pruning, so be it. It's a sermon for another time. But for today, let's rest and just for a moment we'll be quiet. Then I'm going to pray as we come towards our final hymn and to allow the Spirit of God to speak to us as we commit ourselves again to Jesus within whatever context our lives exist, at home, at work, in other places, that we will be those that desire Christ to be our source, that we might then bear the fruit of his Spirit. We'll hold silence just for a moment, I think a useful and underused discipline in the world today. And then I'm going to pray and then we'll come to our final song. Let's be quiet. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, thank you that it speaks to us, Lord, in new ways and in different ways each time we approach it. And Lord, I pray that you, by your spirit, spirit of God, speak to us, not just in this moment, but in these days and in these weeks ahead. For today, Jesus, hear the cry of our hearts. We long to bear good fruit in this world. We long to be those who exhibit that fruit of your spirit. And Lord, we recognise that we need you. We need you. Nothing and no one else will do. So Lord, help us to find you to be the source of this life-giving fruit in this world. Lord, we choose you. Jesus, today we choose to be those that are in you, the, the vine, the, the true vine. Lord, I pray for my sisters and my brothers, Lord, as they go about their day and as they go about their week this week, that with the various circumstances that they face, that they might constantly have you at centre, you at source, and that therefore their actions, their perspective, the ways that they prioritise in this life might be those that are your ways that when they ask for things it's in your name you the one that has given them that sense of source that they might be able to be your servants in this world around and about hear our prayer amen <laughs>